for the resurrection that we've waited for and buried the night we came with the morning you're the king of heaven the praise is yours the longer the quiet the louder the chorus so the living water God we thirst for you the dry and the barren will flower and bloom you're the sun that's shining you restore my soul the deeper you call us oh the deeper we'll go we will sing a new song Come tend the soil, come tend the soil of my soul, and like a garden, and like a garden I will in the soil of my soul and like a garden and like a garden I will grow I will grow I will Good morning, Southbrook. How are we doing? We awake? Feeling it? Brackets all busted? We doing okay? <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're glad you're here this morning. Thanks for joining us this weekend. As, as you know, maybe you don't know, uh, this Sunday kind of marks the beginning of Holy Week going forward. This is the week where, man, Jesus enters Jerusalem, the triumphal entry where Palm Sunday, where everyone is celebrating and how the tide turns over the course of a week. So we're excited that you're here this week. Pete's going to lead off with the tri triumphal entry. He's going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but first, we have some announcements, okay? First thing up, we have women's Bible study getting ready to start up. Uh, here, sh here soon. Like we got morning and night sessions coming up. Uh, the study they'll be doing is when you pray with Kelly Mentor. Um, that's $25. You can register online, but the registration deadline is coming quick. I believe it's March 28th this week. So make sure you sign up for that. It's always really cool to see this building filled uh, in the morning and the evenings with women's Bible study going on. It's a really cool sight. Um, on top of that, we have Easter, which is next weekend. you right. We're all excited about Easter. March 31st, we have a bunch of services for you. Eight 9, 15, and 11. Um, if you are the person who likes to get up very early and wear your PJs to church, we got good news. We have a service for you. That's 8 a.m. We'll have donuts. We'll have an Easter bunny. In fact, this Easter bunny will be skydiving in that morning. So not only will there be a bunny, that bunny's going to skydive in, okay? So weather permitting, if you want to check that out at 730, be here at 730 that morning to see the bunny make his landing. Uh, hopefully safely, all right? 
or that would be a whole other story, all right? If you are a student in middle school or high school, you don't want to miss this. We've got our rush camp coming up this summer, June 24th through 28th, right around the corner, in fact, it's at Camp Chautauqua. All right, you can register at southbrook.org. It's going to be a great week of fun, worship, and teaching. So make sure you sign up for that because I'm sure those spots will fill up quickly. And the last thing we have is Players Box is kicking off here April 9th. If you haven't registered already, there's still enough time to do that um, at playersbox.com.org. Sorry. Um, so sign up there. And in fact, this year, this session is the first time we've opened it up to second graders. So elementary will be second through fourth grade. Fifth grade will be through eighth grade in a separate session, and then we'll have high school in another session. And if you don't know, I lead the parent session. So if you're a parent who just wants to check it out or see what this is all about, you're invited to that. There's a parent-only sign-up as well. So sign up for Players Box. Check it out. We're excited to get that kicked off. But for right now, we're ready to kick off worship. So will you stand up and join us as we worship as the band takes us there? John, Reagan, and Barb leads us in worship. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Well, again, good morning to all of you. It does not matter where you've been, what you've done, uh, what path you took to get here. It does not matter to God. His grace is sufficient for us, and uh, that's a common thread we're going to be singing about today. So uh, join us as we worship. Let's do this. Sometimes on this journey, get lost in my mistakes it looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength and my story isn't over my story's just begun failure won't define me cause that's what my father does sing that again yeah failures won't define me cause that's what my father does Not the end game, the truth. 
shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore
that is praise the Lord. By the way, we live by what we do. Indeed, God, in, in the words that we sing, we praise you. May what we do give you glory. Your grace is sufficient. In this time of the year when we laser our, our, our thoughts and our mind on this season as Easter nears. Let each of us find yet another way to praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we pray this prayer and sing these songs in the name of Jesus, your son, who rose from the dead. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. You guys can grab a seat. You know, one of the things that, if you're like me, that you cherish most about, you know, coming together here in this place, it's getting to celebrate and to witness uh, our brothers and sisters make their decision to make Jesus the Lord of their life. And, and we get to celebrate those baptisms, and we get to do that right now so let's uh, let's celebrate with them Mary who's the Lord and Savior of your life my Lord. amen In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit I baptize you my sister I said, bro, you're going to trim, you're gonna have to bend uh, your knees. Go, That's I'll all go, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> John, who's the Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you, my brother. God bless you guys. God bless you. God bless you. Thanks for letting me do this. Southbrook, we doing okay? Doing all right? I've got my friend Scott Weber coming in here. Uh, really cool story. Scott Weber this month is celebrating eight years of sobriety. Right. That's, cool. That's, cool. That's amazing. And so here this morning before his church family, he wants to make a profession of faith. He wants to let you know who Jesus is to him. And so Scott, if you will, just simply repeat after me, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Amen to that. Because of that, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, Come on, brother. Give me some. Give me some. Yeah. That's, it. That's awesome, brother. I'm happy for you. That's so good. No, never gets old. I love it. Uh, I, I, the f f second baptism reminds me of Back when I was in Xenia, uh, I had a guy who, in fact, he comes, he and his family attend Southbrook. I'm not sure if he's here this service or last, but uh, he was he's 6'8 and about 280 pounds or something like that. And so I tell you, every eye was focused upon that baptistry when the day I was baptizing him. We already had a plan made out, but it was like, everyone's kind of like, is he, how's he going to do that? How's he going to do that? And, and uh, we always make a way, don't we? Uh, hey, I, I'm so thankful for our worship team, our creative arts, our production team for the, this incredible um, lead-in to, to this service. Thank them for what they do, the amount of time. I'm, I get to see that around here, just the amount of time they put into making this a, a, an experience that you will remember. It's not a performance. It, it really, truly is 
uh, a desire to, to provide a gift of excellence for an excellent God, an excellent Lord, and I'm thankful for that. And it, th- this, is a, this is a busy week. This is a, a kind of an exciting week. A lot of things are happening around here. As you pulled in, I know you're seeing the, the, the roof now on the outdoor gymnasium for Players Box. You're seeing that all taking place, unless you're coming in the wrong entrance or the, coming in the exit. If that's the case, you won't see it. But if you're coming in the right way, you'll have seen that. Uh, spring is here. Easter's coming this coming Sunday. This is our week before Easter. Uh, things are kicking into, into high gear or with our women's Bible studies and men's ministry and recovery groups and players box groups and our children and student ministries are at full gear. So a lot of exciting things are happening. And all that is possible because of generosity, because of people like you who uh, love to contribute in such a way to invest in, in what's happening here at Southbrook. So thank you for doing that. When you give at Southbrook, you're not just giving to a, an institution. You are actually a, an, a participant and an investor in those kinds of ministries that are impacting people's lives, where you can bring your friends and coworkers and, and your one, your partners in, in, uh, in athletics, your team players, your coaches, your players that you coach, and you can all bring them here and know it's a safe place where we like to call it where you can kind of just come and kick the tires and just kind of check it out and see what you think because we know that when you do that, you'll meet Jesus. And uh, we're thankful for that. So if you're a regular uh, investor and contributor in generosity, thank you. If you're not and wanting to kind of check things out, uh, you can give tangible gifts. We have the generosity boxes in the front of the main theater, also out the information center. Or you can go online, southbrook.org, and there's just click on donate, or you can pull up your push pay app and contribute that way. And we thank you again for doing that. Um, when I was growing up as a kid, one of my favorite memories, we grew up, have a big, big family. The Creamer family is huge. And we would oftentimes go out to, we called her Grandma Creamer, because she was Grandma Creamer to everybody, even not just family, but even people who lived around her. Uh, she lived on Fishthorn Road in Fayette County, just a little one-lane road out in Fayette County. And we'd love to go out to Grandma Creamer's house and have meals. And Man, we would play games out in the barnyard. Uh, it seemed so big at the time. And if you've if driven by like lately, it's like, what happened? <laughs> it's, it's so tiny now. It used to be so huge. And playing the barn that's no longer there. And, or we're just walking up and down the railroad tracks. Because um, there's a train that would always go by within about, right, cut right through the property, about maybe 30 or 40 yards from the house. Every now and then, on occasion, my brother Randy and I would, would spend the night out at Grandma Creamer's house, and we'd go up into the upstairs bedroom that I think was converted from an attic, very tiny. And, uh, but we knew sometime during the night a train would come by, and we couldn't wait. And uh, we would fall asleep. And finally, sometime during the night, because we fell asleep with anticipation. You know what that's like. You just know something's going to happen. So we'd fall asleep with this anticipation. And finally, we'd start feeling the house just kind of shake. And then it would get, it would almost like a, it would shake even more. And then we'd start to hear the rumble. We'd hear the train come. And then we'd hear the whistle, because it had to blow its horn right before that little tiny country road there, Fishthorn Road. And then we'd rush to the window and, and uh, kind of crowd each other out so we could watch that, that freight train go all the way down right, right past our house. And then what would usually happen another time during the night, we'd get up and do the same thing all over again. But the funny thing was, is the next morning, if we happened to say something to Grandma about Man, we loved seeing the train come by. She said, what train? (laughs) Well, the the train that comes by, oh, yeah. She was so used to it. She didn't hear it, didn't feel it. Obviously, didn't get up the window to look at it, or she probably would never get any sleep at night. But it would just become almost uh, like it never happened to her. And I think sometimes, if you've been a Christ follower for a long time, the same thing can happen to you and I when it comes to things like Easter, that we kind of sleep through it. We, don't, we know it's there. We know it's coming. But we don't have the same feeling and emotion maybe that we used to. One of the books I've read recently by Dr. Kurt Thompson called The Anatomy of the Soul. He's a Christian psychologist, and he talks about a lot of things, but one of the things he talks about is the right and left hemisphere of the brain and how the left hemisphere, we talk about people being left brain, they're very logical, very sequential, and then there's right brain people that are more emotional or deal more with their feelings. Well, 
He, what his talk is, he said, we, we need to have an integrated brain when it comes to our relationship with Christ. Yes, we need to know logical things. We need to understand them as facts. But we also don't lose the right brain, like the right hemisphere. Don't lose the sensation of the, of the emotion and, and the feeling of, of what that means to each one of us. And so he challenges us to have both right and left brains integrated. And that's my challenge today as we, as we approach this Easter season. Don't just know the facts. Don't just say, yep, it's Easter. We know what that's all about. Don't just know the stories. In fact, this week, if you'll follow, if you follow along usually with our questions that are posted on, on social media, uh, I've written those questions intentionally to be a daily devotional with daily readings and daily devotionals that follow along with the Holy Week, this final week of Jesus. Because the birth, death, resurrection of Jesus is the most pivotal, central event in cosmic and human history. And it's also the most pivotal and sequential event in my life personally and in your life personally as a Christ follower. So I challenge you to kind of follow along there and and just kind of engage again all your senses when it comes to this story of this final week. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call them the first four books of the New Testament, are the chronicles of of this life of Christ. In fact, uh, sometimes we look at those books and wonder, why, why did certain gospel writers put things in different order than another? Why don't, they just, why don't we just have one gospel and just tell the story? Well, I think we'd lose the impact of it. And this is the way I like to explain it. It's very simplistic. But if you're right in the middle of uh, magic or the madness of March with basketball, NCAA basketball, you've watched maybe 100 games already. Uh, or you've endured 100 games with your spouse watching those, and I'm not going to make a sexist remark of either the husband or wife watching because we both maybe like to watch it. But maybe it's not basketball. Maybe it's uh, the Major League Baseball. It could be football. It could be the Olympics. But you're going to know what I'm talking about when I say that every now and then there's going to be a certain play or certain event happen in that game that all of a sudden it kind of catches your attention. Maybe it's a phenomenal play that's going to be on a highlight or top 10 list, or maybe it's going to be a controversial call that the official will make you think, oh, that's not right, or maybe it's an injury, and that the next dead ball timeout, what's going to happen? You're going to get instant replay. And there's going to be several different camera angles that are going to show you that play from a different angle. And usually there's one of those angles that's going to say, oh, yeah, the right call was made or the wrong call was made. Or they did score a touchdown, or they didn't score a touchdown, or the the play, you can see really clearly how phenomenal it really was, because there's a different angle. It's the same play. They didn't change the plays, but you're just seeing it from a different angle. And the Gospels are just like that. They're like four different writers with four different writing styles, writing to four different audiences, and with different purposes but it's the same Jesus. And these gospel writers will record a couple paragraphs about his birth. There's only one sentence about his life from about 18 to 30. And about two thirds of the gospels will write about these three and a half years of his ministry, we call it. And then all four of the gospels devote about one third of their content to the last week, one week, this last week of Jesus' life. It's that important. It's that consequential. I think of three words when I think about this, his life, and I want to share them with you today, and I want you to apply them to your life in a few moments, but it's the word calculated, controversial, or rather confrontational, and counterintuitive. And you're going to see where all, all three of these work and how all three of these match and how, how we're going to see them as we look at just basically one story. I'd like to share all the stories, but I don't have time. I'd love to talk about the temple and what happened to the temple. I'd love to talk about the Passover feast up in the upper room, but I'm just going to have to to limit myself just to one, and you'll be glad for that because it'll end on time instead of going on forever, forever, amen. Uh, But let's look at the triumphal entry of Jesus. And here's the text as Luke records it. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt or a young donkey tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. 
Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were tying, untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will even cry out. This is the first day of this final week of Jesus and his entry into Jerusalem. I'm telling some stories about my youth and my early adulthood. When I think of the triumphal entry, there was actually a, a personal triumphal entry. Uh, back at my very first church, I was uh, attending Kentucky Christian University and I'd been hired at the Allensburg Church of Christ to be their full-time pastor uh, with the idea that after I graduated from school, I'd come there full-time. So I uh, graduated from school, and Marla and I were married, and we went there, and that was our first ministry at Allensburg, just outside of Hillsborough, Ohio. It was a good ministry. We still have friends there, um, nice, good ties to a lot of the people there. We were there six and a half years. Um, I saw some really neat things happen. In fact, Probably when we were first there, we were running around 175, 200 people in, in worship, and we began to see that grow and, and grow. We were kind of flirting with a 300 mark. And I remember one Easter, about our fourth year or so there, I challenged the, the congregation that if, you'll, if we'll have 500 here for Easter Sunday of that year, I would run to Lynchburg, which is about three and a half, maybe four miles away to the center of town. And I didn't think that was a big deal. Now, I've, I wasn't used to any type of long distance running. I was a you know, played af softball and basketball, but I think mile was the most, the longest I'd ever run. But I was willing to stretch myself. And anyway, the, the day came for Easter and we had 503 in attendance. <laughs> I think the deacon who was responsible for counting added the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit just to make sure we broke the record. <laughs> so I was obliged then to go ahead and do the run. Well, another of our deacons really took this thing and ran with it. I mean, he made this thing a whole lot bigger than what I ever intended to be. We we're going to have a local radio station cover it from the beginning to the end. Uh, we're going to have a deputy sheriff who's going to transport me or escort me down the country roads. And then the, the, local, the local police department, which is one person <laughs> and one car, his name was Barney. I'm not, no, wait a minute. It was, it was windy. Wendy was going to meet me at the edge of Lynchburg and, and escort me then to the center of town when he was going to stop off six lanes of traffic in the middle of Lynchburg. No, we have one traffic light, and the traffic would have been very minimal, but anyway, it was all set up. And so the day began, and this is what it looked like when I was getting ready to start the race. There's our gospel ship in the background, so... The race was about to run. They also recruited uh, some students who were going to do a, a relay race alongside of me, which I thought, wait a minute, how fair is that? I'm running all by myself, and they're going to have to only have to run a certain distance. But anyway, that's beside the point. Then this is uh, the finish line in the middle of Lynchburg. Thousands and thousands of people gathered there. <laughs> I'm crossing the finish line. And then finally, here is the post-race interview. And you get a good vision of my pork chop sideburns on this one. <laughs> Make even Elvis jealous. But that was my triumphal entry. But it was short-lived, and I have to show pictures to remind people even of it. But Jesus' entry changed the history of the world. And we celebrate it to this day. Because everything changed. Everything changed. It was calculated. Do you know there are some, some estimates from 48 to 60 different prophecies in the Old Testament that all are prophetic in regards to details, specific details of what would happen when the Messiah came. I mean, things like he'd be born in Bethlehem. Not Jerusalem, not some big city that would be easily to guess, but no, a little podunk town called Bethlehem. He would be born of a virgin. Now, that's pretty specific and pretty rare to go out on the limb and say, this Messiah will be born of a virgin. 
And all of these things, there's so many of these specific details. And so mathematicians have, have guessed what it would be the odds of even a few of these to come true. Well, Charlie, a few weeks ago, shared this story. And he said uh, that Dr. Uh, Peter Stoner of Science Speaks says that if 48 of these prophecies came true, then the odds of that happening by random chance, just by chance, is one in 10 to 157th power. And I have no idea what that number is. But it's big, 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 big. And he went on, and if you wanted to listen to that message, go back and listen to it, because he goes into some details, some illustrations of what that number really would look like today. But in other words, it was calculated. It was all calculated. His decision to go to Jerusalem was calculated. Now, up to this point, Matthew, Mark, Luke, especially, those three record how Jesus would oftentimes tell... The, the people whom he has healed or people that he has taught, hey, just kind of keep this to yourself for right now. Just kind of shh. Not because he was embarrassed, but because he knew that if the religious leaders heard about this and it wasn't the right time, they, it would force them to, do, to take action, possibly even to kill him, and he wasn't ready for that yet. But now everything's changed. Now it's different. Mark records in his gospel, right before the triumphal entry, records a story where Jesus and his disciples are traveling. If you've seen The Chosen, you've probably seen this scene. And they're walking along, and there's a crowd of people all in, in, uh, in this entourage. And they come across a, a blind man who's sitting by the side of the road. And the blind man hears all this commotion. And he says, what's happening? And someone says, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And the blind man yells out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I don't know what that means to you today, but to then, it was son of David. David, the king, the son of David would be the Messiah. He's, he's acclimating the Messiah of Jesus, being Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Messiah. And there was a time earlier on when Jesus might have said, okay, shh, 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 let's just keep this quiet for right now. But he doesn't do that now. He allows him to verbalize his praise. He says, what would you like for me to do for you? And the man says, I want to see. And Jesus said, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Very public. Very public. All of this has changed. His manner in which he enters Jerusalem was calculated. If you remember the text that Luke records, he tells a couple of his disciples, I said, I'm going to send you on assignment. We call it today a scavenger hunt. I want you to find this, this young colt, this young donkey, donkey having never been ridden before. And I'm not just going to say, take it to the rodeo where they can kind of be a show. No, Jesus is going to ride this, a colt that's never been ridden before. And I want you to go and just, if you find it, he doesn't give any more description. He doesn't tell him where to go. He says, if you just find this animal, it'll be tied up. And when you take, bring it to me, and if somebody asks you why you're untying it, just tell them. What was it? The Lord needs it. That's it. I off, it beg, the question begs to be asked, who is the owner? We don't know. Was it a very wealthy man who could afford to see, uh, give one of his animals and just say, take it, it's yours. I don't, I don't need him or her. Or was it maybe a, a, a poor widow who's lost her husband and that was her source of livelihood. She needed that animal more than anything maybe. Regardless, it's someone obviously who, who knew the Messiah, and when someone says, hey, the Lord needs it, it's yours. They're not telling her, will you ever get it back? We don't know. I'm just willing to surrender. And by the way, to me, that's a great example of just what it means to the difference between being an owner, feeling yourself as an owner, or a manager. If you're an owner, you say, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's mine. That's mine. Uh, I'll lend it to you. Let's write up a contract. You fill it out and you bring it back in certain days. It's like, like a rental, like rent, you, you haul, rent, or rent a donkey, you know, something like that. As opposed to a manager who says, you know what? This doesn't belong to me anyway. If the Lord, who is the owner, needs it, it's his. Take it. And by the way, this also was prophesied hundreds of years before. Zechariah says this. 
He says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Hundreds of years before it happened. And so the manner was well calculated. Now, why would a king come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey as opposed to a great stallion as a conquering hero? If you ever watched Braveheart, Mel Gibson, imagine Mel Gibson and Sancho Panzo switching rides. So Mel Gibson now is riding on the donkey, and Sancho Panza of Man of Mancha is riding on the stallion. Well, that would be fine, but I, Mel Gibson on a donkey just doesn't kind of do it for Braveheart, does it? So why is Jesus doing this? It's obviously something that's very, very meaningful to him. In fact, it might have to do with a, a story that he, was, he would have been very familiar with and as well as the Jewish audience would have been familiar with. Back 200 years earlier than this, this was a part of their history. Judas Maccabeus was a Jewish priest, and he led a revolt army to overtake the Seleucid Empire that had captured Jerusalem, had, had besieged and des desecrated the temple. And he leads an army then to, to retake Jerusalem, clarify and purify the, the temple. In fact, the book of Maccabees in the Catholic Bible uh, talks about Judas Maccabeus and, and recognizes him as a great warrior champion. And as he entered in Jerusalem, they waved the palm branches just like they're doing for Jesus now. So maybe Jesus had this, this contrast in mind to say, you don't need another Judas Maccabeus. He's a part of your history. That's fine. But I'm not coming like he did. My coming is different. It was calculated. It was also confrontational. Do you know where Jesus goes first? He doesn't just ride into Jerusalem. He it doesn't sneak in. He doesn't hide, have secret meetings because I don't want to be caught. He publicly, boldly rides in. And the first place he goes is to the temple. And what he does there blows everybody's mind. Blows our mind sometimes. We got, what's, what's this all about? I wish I had time to go into that for you, but I don't. But let, let me just say this. When he goes in and basically rearranges the furniture in the temple, he says, I want my house. Think about what that meant to the people around. I want not, not Yahweh's house, not Jehovah's house. I want my house to be a place of prayer and a place of real worship for all the nations, not just the Jews. And this is my house. And I'm rearranging the furniture in the house. So it's very conf conf confrontational. Later on, he, uh, through the week, he, he, uh, he goes and approaches the, the this religious leaders and the scribes and Pharisees. He's going to deal with them very, very straightforward on their traditions. There's an old story told of an Eastern European synagogue, and a young rabbi was the, the new rabbi there, and he was having a problem because half of his congregation, when they did the Shema prayer, would stand up for the prayer, and the other half would be, remain seated. And they started yelling at each other, the ones who were seated, saying, sit down. And the one standing said, you need to stand up. And they would bicker and fight with one another. And the, the young rabbi didn't know what to do. And so he thought, well, someone suggested, well, you know, there's an, an older member of, of the community here, 90 years of age or so, that used to be, was one of the founding fathers of, of the synagogue. So why don't you go and ask him what the tradition was or is of the synagogue? And maybe you could find out the answer. So he took a, a person from each of those different factions, and he went and visited with the, the older gentleman. And he said, we've got a problem here. Maybe you can help us solve. And so the one person said, is it not our tradition to stand during the Shema prayer? And the older man said, that is not our tradition. So the other guy said, oh, okay, so then it is our tradition to sit during the Shema prayer. He said, no, that is not our tradition. And the rabbi was just totally flustered and said, we were hoping you would help. All they do is fight about whether they should stand or whether they should sit. And finally, the, the old man interrupted and said, now that is our tradition. <laughs> and Jesus is coming now to deal with those kinds of attitudes. 
We're willing to hold on to our tradition. I don't care what it means. That is more important to me than anything else is to hold on to our traditions. And Jesus confronts them, even to the point that at times they're going to tear their cloaks because they're so angry at what Jesus is saying. And ultimately, they will want him killed. It was counterintuitive. He's telling us something about him, but he's also telling us something about ourselves. That he came to rule and to save, but not by taking military might, not by force, not by fighting to survive, but by serving and willingly giving up his life. It's this upside-down kingdom that he's been modeling and teaching all along. But the people who are waving their palm branches and pulling out their cloaks and and saying all their hosannas and and praises, they were very short-sighted, just like we are today sometimes. First of all, in, in... and what we are asking for versus what we really need. Let me say that again. Sometimes we are very short-sighted in what we're asking for versus what we really need. A good friend of mine who was my boss back at Xenia Municipal Court, Mike Murray and his wife Patty, their attend- they're Southbrookers and their two sons, he was telling them a story a number of years ago. Um, they were flying to Florida and their two boys uh, Daniel, their youngest, would have been five or six at the time. He's just turned 40 this past week. So they were flying, and they were at their cruising altitude, and, and they began to experience really severe turbulence. And the boys had never experienced this before, and they were scared. And uh, even Mike said it was probably at the time, that was probably the most severe turbulence he'd ever experienced. And everyone in the, in the plane is just very quiet, kind of wondering what's going to happen. And, and finally, Daniel, again, five or six leans over to his dad said, Dad, I, I'm scared could I say a prayer? And Mike said, that, that's a great idea. And so Daniel prays. He says, God, put us on the ground right now. <laughs> and Mike said, said, that was one time I really claimed the passage in Romans that says the Holy Spirit intercedes for us when we don't know how to pray or when we pray for the wrong things. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for not putting us on the ground right now. Put us on the ground safely. But that the point is that what we ask for sometimes is so, it's really shallow compared to what God wants to give to us. They were treating Jesus like a celebrity. Like he was going to come in and take care of all their, all their needs and take care of all their wants, to get rid of all their, their enemies, and specifically the Romans, when Jesus wanted to come and change their hearts and lives. The real problems wasn't the Romans. It was, it was individually, each one of them personally. When, a couple of weeks ago, or when we had our, our uh, Super Bowl Sunday, Super Sunday, I'm sorry, Super Sunday, uh, our Elvis impersonator, how many of you got to watch him? He was, he was great. By the way, there were several people that went up to Saul Gomez and said, man, Pete did a great, great job impersonating Elvis. They thought it was me. <laughs> well, I do have the pork chop sideburns, but uh, it was not me. Uh, it was Ryan Roth was his name, but he did a great job. But what was hilarious was uh, watching him in the, in the atrium and the number of people who were lining up to get his autograph. And I wanted to think, in fact, I was talking to the guy who plays keyboard for me. He says, this happens every place we go. There's this long line of people wanting to get Elvis uh, autograph. And he said, do you not realize that Elvis has been dead for over 45 years? This is not the real Elvis. This is an impersonator. But we we do that. We we bake people into celebrities. Our athletes are, are... Hollywood people, we we make them into celebrities and we want them to do something for us that God never intended for them to do for us. Only he can meet those kinds of needs. And so it was confrontational in that regard. It's counterintuitive because God wants to to come and do things in our lives and he sees things differently than what we see. I think of the story of, of the prophet Samuel who was given instructions by the Lord to say, I want you to go to this town, to the house of Jesse, and I want you to anoint the next king. And so Samuel does it. Again, not a lot of instructions, not a lot of detailed instructions, just go to, and one of his sons, well, he has eight sons. Which one is going to be? So he has all the sons line up. He thinks all the sons line up, and all of them line up. And Eliab, the very oldest one, is, is quite an impressive-looking young man. And Samuel says, surely this is the next king. And God says, no, not him. He asks all the other sons to come up one by one. Is it him? No, it's not him, not him. All through seven. You have, how many sons do you have? Well, I have eight, but the other one's the young. He, he's out tending the sheep. Well, I need to see him, so bring him in. So it brings David in. 
And Samuel sees David and God says, "Uh uh-huh, that's the guy. And he says, God looks at things differently. He doesn't look on the outside. He looks on the heart because that's what he wants to change. He wants to change you from the inside out. And so what God sees and what God wants to do, Paul says this in Ephesians, he says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is work within us, how much, listen, what we ask is always going to be shallow compared to what God wants to do and what he wants to provide. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, God always gives you what you would have asked for if you only knew everything he knows. That's right. Now, let's bring this to home. I want to talk about our personal Holy Week. Now, let's think with the right side of our brains. We know that Jesus came, that we celebrate that. Every single day, something different happened. But what what does he want to do today? He wants to enter into our lives triumphantly. And make sure that our hosannas and our praises are not just surface things. Make sure they come from the heart. Because those people, they were shouting hosanna one day and crucify the next. They were shouting crown him one day and kill him the next. Make sure our praises are from the heart, from sincere desire, because what he wants to do in your life. And know that when he comes, it's going to be confrontational. It is. He's going to see things in your life and in my life that need to be different. He's going to rearrange the furniture. Now, if I came into your house, you invited me over for supper sometime, and I'll walk in, I said, you know what? I don't like the couch sitting there. I'm going to move it over here. Uh, I don't like the way you have this picture hung. I don't really like the picture. Oh, let's just change and put this picture. You say, what? <laughs> I don't think so. You don't own this house. We own the house. But that's the point. If Jesus owns the temple, if it's his house, I want my house, I want your life, my life, to be a place of prayer and a place of devo- sincere reflection and worship. Then he's going to rearrange the furniture. He's going to want every closet, every secret thing that maybe we've been hiding. If I'm going to be real in your life, let me into every part of your life. I'm going to rearrange the furniture. Um, I love the story. In fact, I I love all the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, The fifth of the seven books is called The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And in this book, C.S. Lewis tells us a little bit about Eustace. And that's the first time we're really introduced to Eustace. And uh, we're familiar with Peter, Lucy, Susan. If you're familiar with the Chronicles at all, you know those names in the land of Narnia and Aslan, the, the personification of Christ, the great lion. But here we have Eustace. And Eustace uh, is a cousin of, of Lucy. And so Eustace is on, the, on a ship now. They're traveling with this king of Narnia and they're looking, looking for the dragon's island and because they're going on quest to kill the fire-breathing dragon. So they land, and uh, Eustace is very self-centered and very lazy, and he doesn't want to do anything. So as they land, there are all kinds of responsibilities they need to do to kind of take care of the, the, the ship and land and put all the stuff out on the, on the land. Well, Eustace decides, I don't want to do any of that. So he, he sneaks off, and he gets lost. He can't find his way back. A big thunderstorm comes, and Eustace is looking for a place to hide, so he finds a cave. He goes into the cave, and the deeper he goes in, he begins to realize, this is the dragon's cave. And as he goes in deeper, he finds all these jewels, I mean, gold and silver and and just all over the place. This is the dragon's lair. And and Eustace is amazed. He's thinking, all this is going to be mine. And he he begins to to kind of almost like take a bath in all the jewels and all the the gold and everything. And, and, And he writes... Lewis writes that something begins to change in Eustace that even he, even he didn't realize. And now, understand, this story about Eustace is a story about me. It's a story about you. So Eustace is, he falls asleep. And when he wakes up, he sees to his horror a claw, the claw of a dragon. 
He's thinking, oh no, while I was sleeping, the dragon came in and he, he starts to kind of even try to say something or to yell or to, to cry out and he sees fire and he realizes, oh my goodness, this dragon is a fire-breathing dragon. It's not until he, he goes out of the cave and he sees a pool of water and he looks in the pool of water and realizes that the dragon that he's so afraid of is his, it's himself. He's the dragon. He finds some people from the ship, and they, he was able to, to, to relate to them that it's actually useless. I'm not a real dragon. And no one can figure out how to bring the transformation of him from the dragon to a human again. They try everything, and they can't until he meets Aslan. And Aslan tells Eustace, I can take the dragon skin off with my claw, but it's going to hurt. And Eustace is fearful, but he relents. In the last two paragraphs of this book, he tells his story of his encounter with Aslan. And as you hear this, again, I'm Eustace. You are Eustace. Think about this in a personal way. The very first tear he made of the dragon skin was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I'd ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off, and there it was lying on the grass, and there was I as smooth and soft as a peeled switch and smaller than I had been. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much, for I was very tender underneath now that I would no skin on. And he threw me in the water. It smarted like everything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. And as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone. This week starts a really dark week. And some of you are in a place where it kind of feels like the dark. I want you to go back to the story of Grandma Creamers for a minute. And I want you to think about the feeling of the bed or the house shaking and shaking more and the, the sound of the whistle and the excitement of seeing the train go by. And I want you to re-engage your right brain now as you think about this dark week and all the things that are, that are going to happen that ultimately lead to the death of Jesus. And I want you to, for the next five minutes, just kind of remain in your seats, fully engage an integrated mind of the logic, the truth, and the emotion and the sensation. And maybe, maybe God has something to say for you. Humanity was lost. God's creation cherished and adored heavily impacted. Sin severed the connection between humanity and God's presence. The world ached for a savior. They yearned for a reunion with their divine creator. The world stood still as humanity waited and waited and waited. But there was a plan, a plan to rescue a definitive blueprint for the deliverance of his people. Something waits within the shadows Like an army in the night Lock the doors and bore the
A man arises amidst the shadows cast by the Roman Empire. Whispers of a savior echoed through the ancient streets. His name was Jesus. A man who boldly proclaimed the truth despite threats from many. His final stop, Jerusalem. There, as his heart burdened with emotion, he prepared to fulfill his purpose. For his plans will change humanity forever. <laughs> 